Well, greetings, church family. Good to see you all this morning. And here we are again on another very significant occasion, the 4th of July. Independence Day. Woohoo! Right? <laughs> so is anybody planning on fireworks? Yeah. They've already started, haven't they? <laughs> but we're already getting some, and, and our, of course, our dog, CJ, is hoping it won't be too bad this year. Uh, so while I was growing up, it was, the 4th of July was one of my favorite holidays. It's right up there with Thanksgiving. Uh, you all may have noticed I'm a little patriotic. And uh, I committed 21 years and three months on active duty. Uh, counting my reserve time, I have a total of 26. And I don't say that to brag, you know, not by any stretch. I'm proud to have given the... You know, I was given the opportunity to serve, and I did. So I don't feel special because of it, but I do feel satisfied. In spite of the very intense challenges that we are facing in our country, you know, you may have watched the news a time or two lately. This is still the greatest nation on the God's green earth. It still is. And we just hope it will remain that way. Well, this is not a 4th of July message. <laughs> if anything, I'm consistent, I guess. Uh, I've managed to mess up just about every holiday so far this year. And by mess up, I mean that I didn't prepare anything specific for whatever holiday was going on. Uh, except for Easter. You know, I did do an Easter message. That's about it. Ironically, many of these holidays have fallen on Sundays. So... Uh, Seems even odd to me that I would talk about something else when that came along, but I did. So next year, there are not quite as many that are going to fall on Sundays. But so I guess you could say there were some lost opportunities in that regard. But I've had an agenda. My agenda has been to get through Luke. You know, I didn't want to just rush through it. You know, I didn't want to sacrifice any of the teachings or anything. But it's a very important foundation. I want to do my best to do justice and build that foundation for the book of Acts. So today is a transition day. And Acts is a the flip side of the Jesus story, the church's side. And to be specific, uh, well, it's also written by Luke. Luke writes both of them. So the 4th of July is significant. We correctly and appropriately honor today as our beginning. And we did, we have had a history that led us up to 1776, but this day symbolizes our national origin. 245 years ago today, we declared independence from England and claimed sovereignty and embarked on a great experiment. And no amount of revisionism can change that. Today's been important because God used capable men and women of all races to lay a foundation of freedom and equality. It comes across as nearly perfect on paper. A little harder to realize in action. We're not perfect, just more perfect. We've had some hiccups. We even fought a civil war. But generally, the trend has been upward. And we've made major progress in almost every regard in spite of what some folks may be saying nowadays. What I want to talk about is something else even more significant. That roughly two-month period around the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and the genesis of the church. That's easily the most historically significant period in the history of the world. Jesus has died. An innocent man died. He was crucified between two criminals. They were clearly not innocent. They deserved to die. They represented the original Adam at his worst. One, like Cain, completely despised and rejected every opportunity to rule over sin, to resist it, to defeat it, as God told Cain he must do. God had told him that sin was crouching at the door, waiting to devour him. But he must rule over it. 
neither criminal on that on either side of Jesus execute no, that were executed for their crimes. Neither one of them managed to do that. But one of them realized that he was in the presence of Jesus, the Christ. An innocent man. He rebuked the other criminal who never repented. And he uttered the only plea he could muster. One that he had no claim to. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Well, others declared Jesus innocent. The centurion declared him innocent. But at the moment of death, God declared him guilty. But it was not his guilt. It was our guilt. It was Adam's guilt. It was even the criminal's guilt. He was taken down from the cross and buried in another man's grave, a member of the very council that had falsely accused Jesus. This man, Joseph of Arimathea, he was looking for the kingdom of God. All he found was a dead man, a disgraced rabbi. But Joseph knew who Jesus was. He took his body and buried him in his own tomb, and it was sealed with a stone. Because it was a Sabbath, the last day of the week, his burial preparation had to be delayed until the first day of the week. So when the women arrived, they found the stone rolled away, and the body of Jesus was nowhere to be found. While they were in a state of bewilderment, two men appeared in dazzling apparel, angels and pronounced, why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here, but he has risen. And then began the witness, the inquiry, and the appearances. Jesus appeared to two unidentified men on the road to Emmaus. Now, Luke does not record Jesus appearing to the women, strangely enough. Two men in dazzling apparel appeared to them. They were the first witnesses of the resurrection. His final appearance was to the disciples in Bethany. Now, some 40 days appeared to have lapsed between verses 35 and 36 in Luke chapter 24. Luke does not account for that time in his gospel, but he mentions some details that are there in Acts chapter 1, and it helps us fill in the gaps. One thing that's odd is on this last day when Jesus ascends into heaven, the disciples are startled and appear to need proof that Jesus is Jesus. Where were they? They were surprised, but why? Why were they surprised? They shouldn't have been, right? It shouldn't have been difficult to identify Jesus, to recognize him. It also seems odd that Jesus would wait until the ascension day to open their minds to understand the scriptures. The only way to reconcile any of this, these differences, is to understand that Luke is collapsing and blending events. It reads as if all this happened on the same day. But if all that happened on the same day, then Acts chapter 1 doesn't make any sense. Acts 1 verse 3 says, Jesus appeared to them presumably often during the 40 days, which means the events in Luke 24, 36 to 53, could have occurred at various times throughout that period. Well, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15 that Jesus appeared to over 500 people between the resurrection and the ascension. So the gospel, Luke's gospel, is merely highlighting the significant sayings of Jesus leading up to the ascension by collapsing these, these events. Well, there are some other sticky points in this story of the ascension. The two accounts are not identical. So it, here's, a, here's a slide that puts them side by side. There it is. In Luke, the ascension appears to be on the same day as Jesus' appearance to the disciples on the day of his resurrection. But in Acts, 40 days pass between his resurrection and the ascension. So we've got a, a little problem with time there, right? Luke appears to have condensed these events. He preserves only what's essential to the narrative at hand. 
because he has a different purpose in telling it in the gospel than he has in telling it in Acts. Same story, but different purpose. They are witnesses in Luke of what has happened, but will be witnesses in Acts to what's about to happen. The reaction of the disciples is different as well. In Luke, they worship Jesus and bless God. But in Acts, they gazed intently into heaven and were schooled by two angels who asked them, why do you stand looking into heaven? Much like the two angels asked the women, right? Why do you seek the living among the dead? What's interesting is only Luke records the ascension of Jesus. Did you know that? Of all the gospels, as he records it as a specific event with time and place. Matthew and Luke, Luke uh, or Matthew and Mark rather, allude to the ascension, but they don't really mention it. They place Jesus and his disciples in Galilee. Luke puts them in Bethany at the edge of the Garden of Gethsemane. He describes the crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension as separate events. In Acts, that separation is magnified by that 40-day interval between the resurrection and the ascension, where Jesus appears to witnesses throughout the 40 days. The gospel is interested in the final appearance of Jesus. It's giving closure. It's on his instruction to the disciples to be in and remain in Jerusalem in order to receive the promised Holy Spirit and power. The ascension then becomes the pivotal event that transitions the Jesus story to the story of the church. Jesus did not merely ascend out of sight and out of mind, but he ascended to the throne of power and authority as the absolute sovereign of the universe. The church restored Israel becomes the body of Christ in the world, anticipating the return of King Jesus at the end of time to redeem his people and all creation. For a while, Jesus was with us, Emmanuel. Then he died and was raised. For a while, Jesus was with us again. Then he ascended on high. Now you see him, now you don't. Jesus was with the disciples daily for years. The conventional understanding is that Jesus' ministry lasted about three to three and a half years. The Gospel of John records three Passovers. That's why we say that, about three years. But three years is still just a guesstimate. No one really knows for sure exactly how long Jesus' ministry was. If he only had the Gospel of Luke and none of, not the other three to go by, it could have been as short as one to one and a half years. But it was almost certainly longer than that. And also what's written down in all the Gospels is not a strictly chronological, detailed, blow-by-blow -blow account of the life and ministry of Jesus. That would make for a very long, multi-volume work that would take up significant shelf space in a library. The seminal transitional event that links the story of Jesus with the story of the church is the ascension of Jesus. It's what binds everything together. Luke tells it differently in the gospel because they're looking back at what has been accomplished, but in Acts, they are looking forward to what will be, to what must be. So here we are at the crossroads. This is not the end of Luke, but the beginning of the church. And it leaves us with a very important question. What does the ascension of Jesus mean? Is it just a story? Just an interesting fact that Luke decided to share? Well, it means the period of Jesus, his in-person, on-the-job training of the disciples has come to an end. They're no longer getting ready for the passion of Jesus, that is to sacrifice himself for the salvation of the world. But they have now transitioned to the anticipation of Jesus' return. It means that Jesus reigns 
supreme over all creation. He is the Lord and master of the universe. He is our sovereign over any and every form of human government. Only he is worthy of our fealty, our loyalty, our faithfulness. His reign is absolute. A mere 10 days after this, after he ascends into heaven, on the day of Pentecost, the church, which has renewed Israel, restored Israel, receives the promise of the Holy Spirit. Each and every person who puts on Christ is gifted with the personal indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is on the throne. The Spirit in our beings, the mission of the church as partners in the mission of God, is now a full-on functional reality. The fact that Jesus died means that sin is no longer able to bind us in any an inescapable contract with death. I can't do that. The fact that Jesus was raised means that death is no longer able to hold us in inescapable torment. The fact that Jesus ascended into heaven means that he has entered into an inescapable glory. Being in Christ and participating in his mission means we will not only be sustained in his mission, but we ourselves will participate in his inescapable glory. We all, in our hearts and out loud, we shout, he is risen. It's the Easter message. But we now have officially gone beyond that. The gospel was not completed by the empty tomb. He also appeared to witnesses. But the greatest accomplishment of God in Christ was not and is not just the risen Lord. It's also the ascended Lord. He is at the right hand of God. The only thing left to accomplish is our witness, our participation, and the final redemption and ascension of our bodies. He's coming back in the same way as he went into heaven. So we are witnesses. Oh, we didn't see Jesus while he was walking around, you know, on the first day of the week. We didn't see him then. We weren't there or during that 40-day period, but more than 500 people did, they saw him, they touched him, they spoke to him, and they saw him ascend to glory with their own eyes. Jesus opened the eyes of two men on the road. Then he opened the eyes of the disciples to understand the scriptures. Then he opened the eyes of the crowd in the temple, and everyone saw what they were supposed to see, and it brought faith and conviction and repentance and baptism and the Holy Spirit to make them into witnesses to the world. That's us. Have you seen Jesus? Have you seen him? Well, you might have a little searching to do. He's not hard to find. He's not hiding. He's reigning. He's large and in charge, we say. He didn't just toss us a list of rules to follow, you know, without deviation. While he was passing by, he didn't provide us with a, just a set of guidelines so we can make our order of worship kosher and feel good about it. He is right now, at this very moment, exercising sovereignty. He has risen, but he has ascended. The king of the universe is living and active and present in his creation. There is no higher authority anywhere. Can we really afford to sit around gazing at our navels? You know, like the disciples stood gazing into heaven. He gave us a mission. We are witnesses. He is real and he is very interested in our discipleship. Where can you find this king? Where, where is he? He's in every kind word on an encouragement card. He's there. 
He's in a blessing bag that'll feed a hungry person for a day. He's in every opportunity to share the gospel with the lost. He's in the forgiveness that we dare not deny to the unforgivable. He's in our humility. He's in our repentance. He's in our praise. He's in our needs and our wants and in our hands when we strive to meet the needs and wants of others. He's in every opportunity to serve, even those opportunities that we find inconvenient. He's in our com communion together, our prayers, our songs, every handshake, every pat on the back, every hug. He's there when we reach out and embrace those who struggle, the visitor, the new Christian. We are his hands and feet. And when the time comes, we too will also ascend. Now you see him, now you don't. The world should see him. This is what discipleship means, to become Jesus in the world. Now you see him. He's among us, but we must be Jesus among our community. We must not be Adam and Eve and Cain, but become the risen Savior in this world that God has placed us in. Now you see him. Do you see him? He did not abandon us. He did not ascend and go away. He is ever present. The Holy Spirit is ever present. When we surrender our will to him, we ascend. We become more than what we are and more than what we could be on our own power. We must declare our independence from sin, our independence from self-interest, independence from the influence of the world around us and become influential. We must proclaim sovereignty. Our sovereign sits on the right hand of God and reigns. There will never be a time when Jesus is not the absolute sovereign of all things in heaven and on earth. It's not a great experiment like America. It's a great commission, a great honor. He is in us and through us and by us, he will accomplish all that must be done until he returns to claim us and redeem us. Well, if you feel the need to respond, please do so now. Speak to one of us afterwards. But at this time, let's stand and sing.